Hello and welcome to this Cloud Lunch and Learn Marathon session. This session is on Windows Virtual Desktop and it's about how to boost performance by mitigating user bad habits. My name is Alan Kinan. I'm a Cloud Solutions Architect and a Microsoft Certified Trainer from Dublin, Ireland. You will see my website and Twitter details on the screen. Please do reach out and get in touch if you have any questions on the session. And let's go ahead now and get started. So what is this session all about? Um, I decided to start off by just going over some definitions. So if you're familiar with Windows Virtual Desktop already, these definitions should be familiar to you. If not, I'll just try and explain each of them briefly because I'll be using these terms a lot throughout this session. So first of all, what is Windows Virtual Desktop? Windows Virtual Desktop is a desktop and application virtualization service that runs on the cloud in Microsoft Azure. So desktops and applications are hosted on Azure Virtual Machines, and these machines are known as session hosts. So a session host is an Azure Virtual Machine, a VM, which is one of several types of on-demand scalable computing resources that Azure offers. An Azure VM gives you the flexibility of virtualization without having to buy and maintain physical hardware that runs it. Basically, you pay on demand for what you need and what you consume. Host pools are a collection of session hosts, those virtual machines we just spoke about, that a user can connect to. Host pools can contain personal or individual machines or pooled shared session hosts. Users then, a user is a user who gets assigned to a host pool and connects to one of its individual session hosts to access the desktop resources and applications. All right, so this session is gonna focus on pooled session hosts. So those are the shared session hosts that multiple users connect to and share the resources on. So that means those virtual machines, those session hosts are sharing their compute resources. So their virtual CPU, the RAM, GPU, if they have a GPU card, the disks on that virtual machine, and the virtual NIC on the machine as well. So the, as you can see from that simple diagram, multiple users all connecting into a single virtual machine, but sharing the resources on that virtual machine. So what are the key questions when you have a shared environment like this? Well, firstly, you're going to wonder, how many users can I provision per session host? And the answer to that is it all depends. So what kind of workload will the users be running? How many users will be connected concurrently? So if you have maybe 10 users assigned to a machine, maybe only five or six of them will be connected at the same time, in which case you only need to size it for the maximum number of concurrently connected users. You can use some baseline sizing recommendations. So for example, Microsoft has a guidance on this of assigning two users per vCPU core for what are considered to be heavy users. And that's a good starting point, but it's certainly not an exact science. It's gonna vary from customer to customer because no two users are exactly the same. You can also use third-party benchmarking tools to help you to size your environment based on the application usage. So this can be a good idea if you've got a large migration to do to Windows Virtual Desktop. You may want to do some performance analysis prior to the migration and do some benchmarking on the applications that the users will be using just to see what level of performance is required. And the second key question is, can user activity impact the performance of other users on the same session host? And the answer to that is yes. So right now there is no native Windows Virtual Desktop user throttling feature. If one user happens to be consuming all of those resources, it is going to affect the other users connected to that session host. And this is a problem. So this session is about some ideas you can do to help with sizing and to mitigate against those user bad habits and poor behavior that can affect other users. So what sort of activities can have a negative impact on other users? Some common examples would be disconnecting from sessions for extended periods without logging off. So this is where your users may be connected to a session host. They may have done their work for the day and rather than logging out at the end of the day, they simply disconnect from the session. I'll circle back to this point later on because this is a, a major talking point for this session. 
Another common example would be opening loads and loads of applications and leaving them running in the background when they're no longer required. When we have a personal machine, a personal desktop or laptop, for example, this is something most of us are probably used to doing. We'll open up our applications at the start of the day when we need them first, and we'll probably just leave them open until the end of the day, just in case we might need to go into them again at some point. Um, so they'll all be running in the background and consuming resources when they don't really need to be. You can just simply close them and reopen them later if you would need to do that. And web browsing. So web browsing is a very RAM intensive process and quite CPU intensive also, especially when we're using uh, browser tabs, which pretty much all browsers have nowadays. This is a bad practice because again, these browser tabs each consume resources, particularly RAM. And if you've got all of your users doing similar, opening 10, 20, 30 tabs at a time, all of these resources are definitely going to have a negative impact on the users sharing that session host. So one of the things you need to look at is what is your Windows Virtual Desktop environment intended for? So what was it? what's the purpose of it? Why was it deployed in the first place? Is it meant to be a full desktop or just a means to access some desktop applications? So perhaps remote app is an alternative if you just need to publish a few line of business applications. But there's no point in giving a user an entire desktop environment if they just need to access one single application, as an example. If you give them a full desktop, they're going to use it. They're going to start using whatever they can find on it, including the web browser. They may There may be no requirement for that. So if you just need to publish a particular application, maybe, for example, um, an accounts package for someone in the accounts department, just use remote app. It'll therefore only use the resources required uh, to run that application and not, not the full desktop environment. Do they need to access the web from the remote desktop? This is definitely convenient because when you're in that remote environment and if you need to access various websites and applications, it's right there, you can use it. But it may not be required if there is an option to use the web browser on your local endpoint device, that is the device you're connecting into the WD environment from, why not just get the users to use that? It will save a huge amount of resources in your hosted environment. And do your users know that it's a shared environment? Have they been informed about this? Have you educated your users to tell them, well, actually, this system you're connecting into is shared by your colleagues? The more applications or websites you access, the more it could have a negative impact on your fellow workers. Education can go a long way here. Educating your users just make them that little bit more conscientious about their fellow co-workers that they're sharing this environment with. Just to focus back now on logging off versus disconnecting from your sessions. So the difference here is logging off. When you log off of your session, it's just like shutting down your own machine, you're closing out of all your applications, you're logging off that user and the user's profile completely. The resources are mostly returned to the host, so when you close out of your applications, that memory, for example, is freed up again and goes back to the session host. Now, you don't get it all back, there are memory leaks in just about every application, so you can't guarantee that you know just logging off of the session gives all of those resources back, but the vast majority of those resources should go back to the session host for other users to use. And that's a good thing, that's what you want. On the other side then, simply disconnecting from a session, all that does is close out from the session. It leaves all the applications and open files running in memory, consuming resources. So if a user closes out of a session, they can come back and reconnect to that session um, later on in the day and they will resume that desktop experience exactly where they left off all of their applications and their files will be exactly where they left them running. Again, this can be a nice thing to do. It can be a really good feature if you need to step away for a short period of time, but you certainly don't want to do this for an extended period. You do not want users disconnecting, for example, from a session at the end of the day and then resuming that first thing tomorrow morning. That will leave all those resources running overnight having a negative impact on any users who happen to still be working on that. This is something you want to avoid for extended periods. So why are those users not logging off fully? A couple of common reasons here. One, they don't know how. I have come across this many times over the years. 
uh, with remote desktop services and now Windows Virtual Desktop. Some users don't know how to log off. They do, but they don't realize it's the same as how they would log off on their own computer. So they just simply click on the X because that is what's familiar to all users. They'll see that nice X at the top of the screen. They know that means that's how you close something and they will just click on that and they'll go, yep, that's quick and easy, I'll just do that. They haven't actually been shown, here's how you log off. Another common one is they're too lazy. They don't want to have to log in and open their apps every single day again. So by clicking on that X, they can come back tomorrow morning with their coffee at nine o'clock, connecting to the session, and everything's exactly where they left it. Their Outlook's open, their Teams is open, the file they've been working on is exactly where they left it. They don't have to open all the applications again and wait for everything to open up. That can be convenient, but it definitely has a negative impact on all of the other users. Memory leaks and so on will, will start occurring, and sooner or later you're just going to have to restart that session host just to clear out the memory cache and free everything up again. So do your users know it's a shared environment? So I mentioned this before. Educate your users, let them know it's a shared environment, make them aware of the environment they're working in, show the users the difference between logging off and disconnecting. There are advantages to disconnecting, yes, and that's fine. I'm not saying you should get rid of that option because if there's a temporary internet disconnection, they're gonna get kicked off the session host. And if that means they're logged off, they could potentially lose some work. So you don't want to remove that option you just want to limit the time available for disconnecting from a session. More on that in a minute. So educate the users about the difference between the two and inform them about the implications of not logging off, what that means. That's going to create maintenance for the IT department because if users aren't logging off, you're going to start sooner or later hearing about slow sessions, users being negatively impacted. You're going to have to restart session hosts, possibly during business hours. These are all things you want to avoid as an IT pro. You don't want to have to do these things by educating your users. You'd be surprised how far this can go. Like I said, a little can go a long way here. So don't make any assumptions and don't skip over educating the users about the environment they're using. So a little bit more now on mitigation against those long running sessions. So if your users are not going to log off, then you need to do it for them. Okay, you cannot have a situation where users can just disconnect and leave a session disconnected for, as I said, overnight or even for days or weeks. I have seen users go away on a holiday for two weeks and leave a session open for that full time. So you can enforce this. You can make sure users are forcibly logged off after a set period of time. This can be done using group policy objects. So this is the same way it was always done with remote desktop services. It's the same here now. These policies can be set at the computer level or the user level. So if you want to enforce this for particular machines, you can do that. Or if you want to enforce it for certain users or groups of users, you can do it that way as well. A couple of examples here. So what I mean by this is you can set disconnected sessions to be forcibly logged off after, for example, four hours maybe. So that means if a user has disconnected, once four hours, a period of four hours has elapsed, that user session will be logged off. Okay, so that means if they come back, they will have to log in again fully. They won't be able to resume that disconnected session. Another one you might want to set is active but idle sessions. So this is where a user has not disconnected, so they're still actually connected to a session, but they haven't done anything for an extended period of time. This one you need to be a little bit careful with. So if you're setting this one, and I probably would set something for this one, but I would set it much, much higher, maybe something like eight hours or 12 hours or something like that. So this is just a way again to log off any active sessions, but they haven't actually done anything for a very long period of time. It's just another way to close off uh, a long running session that isn't actively doing anything. And this could be a security reason as well that you would want to enforce this just to make sure um, sessions are not left running indefinitely. I've just left a reference on the screen to the locations of those GPO objects if you want to set those. And a quick tip here, you may want to enable a feature called loopback processing if you want to prevent user GPOs from affecting certain computer objects. So what I mean by that is if you set up these GPO objects um, for users, for particular users, but you only want to affect their 
WVD session hosts, not their um, their laptop or their desktop computer that's in the office. If they're using that for a uh, remote desktop as well, you can apply these policies only to certain computer objects by using that loopback processing feature. So what about those web browsers? Web sites and web applications are very compute intensive nowadays. They use up a lot of CPU and in particular a lot of RAM. And now with tab browsing, the problem escalates because you can very easily just open multiple tabs and go from site to site to site. And you know, who closes tabs when they're finished? I certainly don't. So you wanna get your users into the habit of closing tabs when no longer needed. Um, this is easier said than done, but again, education goes a long way here. Explain to your users that these tabs use up resources. So by simply closing them, you can give back some of those resources to the machine. Again, you're not gonna get all of that uh, RAM back due to memory leaks. You'll see it yourself if you look at the process explorers, you will see you will not get all of those resources back when you close the tabs, but you'll get a certain amount back. So it's a good habit just to get into the practice of closing tabs when you no longer need them. You should standardize which browser your organization uses. So probably best not to have a mix of Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, and so on. Pick the browser that you want to use and restrict it to that. Don't, don't allow any other browsers to be installed. There is a new feature in Microsoft Edge called Sleeping Tabs. This is something I would strongly recommend taking a look at. So what this feature does is it actually puts those browser tabs to sleep after a predetermined time period has elapsed. So by default, I think that's two hours. What happens here then is if you open a tab, if you don't go near that tab for two hours, it will go to sleep. You'll see it gray out in the browser. That means it's not consuming anywhere near as much resources as it normally would. If you need to access it again, you can simply just click on the tab and it will just wake up on demand. So as you can see from this graph here, um, you can see there is a reduction in the amount of memory and CPU usage by implementing this feature. You can roll this out again through group policy, I believe. This can go a long way by boosting the amount of resources available on those session hosts. I want to just give some general tips here now on how you can boost performance and size things better and just some general housekeeping tasks that I find are useful. For multi-user session hosts, these should have between four and 24 vCPU cores. Okay, so never less than four and never more than 24 cores. The reason for this is Microsoft actually advise anything less than four for a multi-use environment isn't considered stable. Okay, so even a, a two core machine for a, um, a couple of users, while it might work, it's not considered to be stable enough to handle multiple sessions. So it's recommended to have a minimum of four cores always. Why no more than 24 cores? Well, once you kind of get up into 32 plus cores, you start to run into processor synchronization issues. Okay, so it actually acts, starts to have a negative impact on user performance when you go above 24 cores. So the advice is usually to scale out. Rather than just keep scaling up the machines and adding more and more resources, it's better to scale out at a second or a third machine. Okay, so maybe go to a maximum of 16 or 24 cores. And then if you need more users, they won't fit on that machine, scale out at another machine of the same size and then load balance your users across those session hosts. Because remember, users are not just sharing the CPU and the RAM, they're also sharing the disks and the virtual NIC on the machine. So by adding another session host, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, you're sharing your users across multiple machines. And that means if you need to do any maintenance, if you need to restart a session host, you're not gonna affect all users, you're only gonna affect the users on that particular session host. So there's lots of good reasons to scale out rather than scale up. Schedule regular restarts of session hosts, that's to flush out the RAM and the cached data. So again, because you've got multiple users sharing the same session hosts, you're gonna to have to periodically restart these machines anyway. Even if it's not to install updates and do maintenance tasks like this, it's just to clear them out. So normally we're used to shutting down our own machines at the end of a day. Again, that just flushes out the RAM and the disk caches and you start it up again every morning. It's the same here. You're probably not gonna do this on a daily basis, but I would 
definitely recommend doing this once a week anyway and schedule it to happen automatically outside hours it can be at a weekend or overnight but just don't forget about restarting these machines periodically you should regularly update the os build your applications and don't forget the fs logics client app the reason for this is microsoft are regularly enhancing the windows 10 multi-session operating system putting in performance boosts performance fixes so it's very important to make sure you keep that build up to date and make sure you're on the latest version same with the fs logics client app you will install the fs logics client when you're setting this up originally but make sure you keep that agent up to date because again there's going to be lots of performance enhancements bug fixes that sort of thing it's important to make sure the agent version is the same on each of your session hosts but do keep that up to date it's something very very easy to forget about it does not update automatically so just remember to to do this routinely i think at the moment there's an update to this about every six months i'd recommend to try out the amd epic processor vm sizes so this will be the das v4 and eas v4 series so these have an amd processor instead of an intel processor this is a higher acu score and from testing i've done with my customers they've definitely seen a noticeable compute performance improvement on this amd series so if it's something you haven't looked at or considered yet i would strongly recommend it it is the same pricing as the equivalent intel size which would be uh, the dsv3 and the esv3 um, so you're not going to pay any more but you should see a better CPU performance um, for most applications, at least the ones I've seen. So something to have a look at if you haven't already. Consider GPU enabled virtual machines. That's to offload the graphics calculations and improve overall user performance. So sometimes this is a requirement if, you're, if your users are doing some design or CAD drawings, that sort of thing. But even so, this can be something worth considering because if you have applications uh, that do a lot of graphics intensive uh, modeling or calculations, that can be something you can offload to a GPU card rather than running it all through the CPU and putting a lot of strain on the CPU. So something that, again, perhaps you haven't considered just because you're not using a specific graphic design application, but it can be something worth trying out to see if it improves performance. Make sure to enable Windows Virtual Desktop Insights. So this is the new Azure Monitor integration that's now generally available for Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, I always say you cannot manage your machines unless you're monitoring them. So you really need to turn this stuff on. You might pay a little bit for it for the monitoring ingestion costs, but it's absolutely worth it. You get some really good performance metrics and data from this. Um, the workbooks that are built into it are really very, very good and a great starting point if you need to do any troubleshooting or right sizing based on performance so make sure you've got that enabled and keep yourself informed of new features that become available so at the time of recording windows virtual desktop has been out for over a year and a half in general availability and we've seen a huge amount of new features come on board in that time and there are a few in public preview at the moment as well so there's constant improvements from Microsoft for the service. So make sure you're aware of those new features, make sure you're testing them when they come out and then rolling them out once you're happy with them and you know how they work. So just to summarize then what we've covered today. So user behavior can negatively impact other users in a pooled, a shared Windows virtual desktop environment. Okay, so the actions of even a single user can have a negative impact on any other users sharing that session host there are no native tools to manage this or to throttle this currently um, i don't know if this is something microsoft have planned i hope it is at some point but right now there are no tools to throttle individual users performance okay so you have to work on this yourself start by educating your users helping them to understand the environment and be aware that it's a shared environment and their actions could potentially have a negative impact on other users set up session limits okay now make sure this is communicated with the organization first you don't just want to set up um disconnection and idle time limits without telling anyone because obviously potentially users could lose some work if they weren't informed that their session would be logged off after a set period of time 
But once all of this is agreed, this is something you absolutely have to set up. For me, this is probably the, the number one takeaway from this session. You need to set up these session limits. Set up sleeping tabs in Microsoft Edge. It's Microsoft Edge only at the moment, but I wouldn't be surprised if the other browser vendors uh, release a similar feature in future. Uh, but this is something I do strongly recommend. Microsoft Edge is quite a good browser in terms of the amount of resources it uses. It doesn't seem to be as hungry as some of the other uh, the other browser vendors. And this feature is really, really helpful, I find personally. So this is definitely something you should consider setting up in that shared environment. Restart the session host regularly. So again, this is just about maintenance, flushing out the RAM, flushing out the disk caches, just do this routinely, maybe once or twice a week, just to keep the machines nice and clean. Keep the session host OS build regularly updated and patched. And don't forget the FS Logics client. Make sure you're updating that uh, when new releases become available also. Monitor your virtual desktops. So make sure you've enabled Windows Virtual Desktop Insights. Make sure you've got that turned on at the very least, even if you're not proactively monitoring it and you haven't set up alert thresholds, at least if you have it turned on, you will be able to do some troubleshooting. If it's not turned on, it's a lot harder to troubleshoot your environments without monitoring enabled. So make sure at the very minimum this is enabled, but ideally you've got to set up some proactive monitoring alerts for that also. And stay informed. So technology is advancing very rapidly. Test and implement the new features when they become available. So just make sure you're certainly aware of the new features as they become available, and ideally that you're actually testing and then implementing them. That wraps up my session. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it interesting and maybe picked up a few points on it there. Um, I'd like to thank the Cloud Lunch and Learn Marathon for accepting the session, and please enjoy the remaining sessions on the series. All the best. Bye.